All right, guys. So here we have some aquarium water. That's just uh, your your normal dirty old aquarium water. Uh, you've got you see the paramecium, and then you see did you see that thing flying by. Hey everybody, and welcome to the secret history living in your aquarium. Today we're going to be talking about fry and paramecium or infusoria and how to start your own culture and also what it looks like feeding it and also we'll take a look under the microscope at what a good culture of paramecium look like which is a type of infusoria technically um, we'll get into that in a little bit but if you want success with your young fry these ones are still living off their yolk sacs but if you want success with very teeny fry, whether we're talking rainbow fish, or we're talking celestial pearl danios, or uh, rasboras, tetras, small rainbow fish like the pseudomagills are also really happy with it, uh, then you really need to get yourself a culture of this stuff to kick the breeding and survival rate into high gear. So. I've already done videos that you can check out about setting up colony breeding situations. Uh, in this tank, we actually have a nursery tank going on. So we have brand new young Corydora venezuelius, and then we have, uh, or venezueliana, however you want to say them. They're the orange and uh, blue colored Corydora. And then we have a number of uh, Malua shrimp, which are just hanging out and living in here uh, to clean things. But they were also there to clean the eggs of the Corridor catfish as a little trick. Uh, Neocaridina will clean them. Some shrimp, however, will uh, actually eat the eggs or uh, rough them up a little bit. But Neocaridina. Uh, a lot of uh, caradina, like crystal shrimp, things like that, the smaller dwarf shrimps will actually uh, take care of the eggs. So, they'll eat the fungus ones and leave the rest alone. Snails, on the other hand, will sometimes eat the healthy eggs and you need to be a little careful about your snail population. At the same time, you can keep a small snail population and that will keep things in check. Right here what we have swimming around mostly are Celestial Pearl Danios and we set that up originally as a colony breeding system and these guys are about a week old right now so they're almost ready to eat baby brine shrimp however they grow at different rates and they can all eat paramecium even into their adult phases now you're seeing the camera having a hard time focusing because these fish are so small but if you want to have something like this tank where I've got somewhere between 50 and 60 of these fry living in this 10 gallon tank right now, uh, you will need to have a culture like this. And it's essentially free to set up. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what paramecium are and uh, how I've set this tank up the way it is right now. So let's jump in right now and look at this culture of paramecium so the white cloudy stuff you see is actually little life forms and in this jar and I'll tell you about how to make this yourself in just a moment but you can make out the kind of sediment looking stuff that's kind of clear and and milky let's get that to focus um, around these pieces of barley now, I've chosen uh, barley corn right there, and this is essentially the same kind of barley you'd use for like a stew or soup or to grind down and use as a barley flour. And all I've done is I've put it into a pot, boiled it for 10 minutes or so, and then uh, taken it out so it's full of starch and placed that into tank water so this is t water from an existing tank that's already cycled so it, ne it can't be a brand new tank it needs to probably be six months old or so ideally there's no set time length though uh, for how old it has to be per se now 
other organisms like little shrimp and things will also eat these but it's mostly for fish. Shrimp tend to graze more on surface area things like you see right here. These are Malawa shrimp or uh, Caridina par per paradente dentata. <laughs> so hard to say. Um, but they're from Sulawesi. And if you can't find these, like I said, Neocaridina are probably your best bet for upkeep and maintenance of a hatchery tank. Now, the paramecium that are in here, the only other thing other than boiling the, the barley corns is I add a little bit of baker's yeast and a little bit of aquarium water, and then you keep the whole thing around 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, somewhere like 18 to 26 degrees Celsius, if you're wondering uh, the conversion there. So... That's all you need to do is you add yeast, a few barley corns. You don't need a lot, especially if you have a good culture of paramecium. And I'm going to show you under the microscope in a moment here what it looks like to have a clean specimen like this one here, which we use a pipette to actually feed from this. So I'll show you my fry eating it. But this is a clean pipette. And we're going to use it, and we're going to go right down to the bottom where there's this cluster of paramecium eating that dissolved starch. And we're going to just put it into the water, and you can actually see it come out in clumps. And that's actually starch and a little bit of cellulose from the plants that is coming out in clumps. And uh, we'll put some over here for them. Uh, and we'll put more just right in the center so you guys can see the fish come and feed off of it. So, uh, again, I pardon the the focus of the, the uh, microscope. But I'm not going to put this pipette straight back into the jar afterwards. Because now it has everything that's in this aquarium. And this aquarium has a whole lot of little uh, infusoria, but we have a pretty uniform culture here, which is handy just so that you know how much to feed. Because some paramecium are four or five times bigger than others. They're a single-celled organism, and they reproduce asexually. They split in half through mitosis, and they, they will split in half into two daughter cells, and then they develop. Well, after that, they actually develop these pseudogenders, and depending on how long ago you read the paperwork, as early as 1909 there are papers published in the Scientific American about what exactly these are and if they have uh, traits that are inheritable, and it turns out that they do, and they, they drift over time when mutations don't go uh, smoothly. So you'll have a little infusoria or a little, uh, a little paramecium molecule, or not molecule, but rather single cell, and it will mutate accidentally just because the genes copy a little bit wrong. And due to the fact that so many of them are born, they live a, a life cycle where they can reproduce within 12 hours, and and that's on the when they're warmer and depending on the strain and the species. But within that, you can kind of grow your own paramecium or you can get a culture from somewhere else. Um, there's definitely science supply websites. There's fish food um, supply places that have them. And then there's also, uh, you know, just... Um, culturing them from your aquarium, and then selecting which ones are growing best. So we'll look, like I said, at the pure one under the microscope versus just some tank water, which will happen to contain them when we squeeze out uh, a sponge. Now, they happen to live pretty much anywhere in your aquarium. There's a few of them, but you'll get a dense population on surface areas that are colonized and have some sort of... Uh, some sort of vegetative matter or tannic matter, so that means sticks or leaves uh, that are dying or that have fallen away and there's some algae on them. 
And the, the paramecium actually feed on both yeast um, and fungi, or essentially the same group, same kingdom as mushrooms. They feed on the network of that growing, or molds, and they feed on bacteria as well. Now, they were originally called animolecules, which I think is kind of a cool name, because early on in science, nobody knew exactly what to make of this life form that seemingly sprung out of water magically. And it turns out that, you know, there's just a few of them, and they're generally harmless, but they'll be even in tap water and things, and there's some strains that are semi-chlorine resistant, and there's others that can't take any, um, so select from your own tank water as the base and you'll probably have the best luck. Now these celestial pearl danios that are swimming all over, they've been eating it all week and they've been growing very fast. Also up here we have some baby gouramis, albino uh, paradise gouramis, if we can get this to focus. There we go. And uh, they're also eating it. Now, this one's ready for baby brine shrimp. It's got a fully developed stomach and eyes and spine and fins. Whereas over here, we have very, very young uh, plecos, and they still have their yolk sacs. So really, this is for fish that have just lost their yolk sac. And you can see some of these, like the one on with those three on the top, the one on the far right, is losing its yolk sac. And so once they do that, they've got a fast little metabolism and they need to eat right away. But your fish hatch at different rates and even adult celestial pearl danios or emerald rasboras, phoenix rasboras, neon tetras, pseudomagills, uh, rainbow fish, you name it, they all will eat paramecium all the way up to adult size. And it's often a really good thing to feed your adult fish, even though it's not going to fill them up at all, it's going to at least trigger in them a sense that there's food for their babies. And that's something that they, they actually look for in the environment, is not just changes in water quality and TDS and water pressure and barometric pressure uh, that we know we can trick fish into spawning with uh, and trick them into a rainy season, but they need to know that there is food for their new little babies. So, let's take a look under the microscope at one of these clean paramecium cultures. And you'll see how uniform they are and how active they are. And when we look at the little clouds like that we just put into the tank, that diffuse around the tank, that's what these little fish are eating. And I know it's hard because they're not focusing, because uh, they're all at different depths in the tank. But there are about about two dozen fish hanging out in the center, and another two or three dozen hanging out around the edges. And that's just from leaving uh, well-fed, uh, being fed live food and frozen food. Celestial Pearl Daniels it left about six of the adults with uh, three or four females and uh, two or three males, and I left them in this tank for about four to five days, and then removed the adults so they're not gonna eat the babies. Now, I also placed this type of stone in here so that when they did lay eggs every morning or every few mornings, the eggs would fall in between this kind of river rock stone and the fish couldn't then go for eating them. However, mold is an issue, and like I said, that's where these shrimp come in. They tend to help clean more so than actually eating any of the eggs or anything like that. Now, we also have a bunch of Corydora fry in here, and they're doing really well, and they're eating the paramecium too. So, it's a really good starter food, even if it's too small, like not needed, it's, it's smaller than you think you need. There we go. There's the Corridor again. Um, it's still a great choice. So let's look under the microscope, and we'll finish this talk up. You already have all that you need to know right now, 
uh, in starting a culture if you just want to boil barley or even just add a few leaves of lettuce or dried turnips or kale or dried squash works great and then you just put it in aquarium water and if you're starting it from scratch you might want to squeeze in filter water or like a sponge filter or some mulm, some of the dirty gunky stuff down here uh, that has all sorts of little microscopic life forms in it and then you will put a top on it that's either barely on and this can cause mold to grow so really the best idea is to put cheesecloth on or make sure that you're coming in every 12 hours at least and opening it and allowing air in and leaving some room for air and then I like to date my jars so that I know how old the sample is. So let's look under the microscope at this sample and uh, then we'll look at just some aquarium water and where these guys come from and then how you can get them to concentrate like this and I hope this is instructive to you. If so, please hit that like button and uh, if you want to know more, if you want to follow the story of these fish in this tank, all six species or so, that have a uh, fry in this tank right now. Uh, you can also subscribe and hit that little bell to follow along. There's lots of other videos and playlists uh, to help you with breeding as well. Both shrimp, fish, and uh, for that matter, plants. So let's look at these under the microscope. All right, guys, so here we have a little piece of barley. I mean, smaller than uh, the head of a pen. And we have little paramecium uh, going about and eating it. Now there's bacteria and yeast growing on it. And that's what that little squiggly guy is uh, circling around to eat. So if we move around a little bit and we adjust the light, you'll see more of these guys. And they're very uniform in size. So you can see some are just doing laps <laughs> in a circle. Uh, and if we zoom in even more, we'll, we'll get a better feel for it. But some are just going around in a circle doing their thing. They're acting a little weird because they're under a microscope and the light and the heat is a bit of a bother. But those are the little things that are living in pretty much all water that we drink and eat and shower with and cook with everything. Um and on a lot of surfaces these little critters so you can see that they would congregate around whatever their food source is uh, and so that's what forms those clouds is when they have a rich food source this one may be pretty spent because there aren't like dozens of them on it but that's what you'll put into your tank and that's what your fish will be drawn to over time so over here we'll, we've got another little cluster of something so we'll focus in on a different depth and see if we see much activity going on here and the the hard part is that they're these little teeny tiny things uh, so they're they're hard to even spot at first even though some of the bigger species or I guess you might want to call it lines of genetics of this critter uh, you can see with the naked eye um, if you zoom in really close with uh, with a camera or you know um, obviously a microscope but even a good digital camera or cell phone can sometimes do it so what's nice about this culture is this is the one from Roland Holtz down at the Portland Aquarium Society and here we can see we've got uh, oh, we were just on the edge of it there we go there's some nice paramecium just chilling out right there um, and you can see that they're um, rather, that one right at the top there, they're rather uniform. They look like a little oblong oval um, or slipper. And right there we've got one splitting most likely, two daughter cells that are next to each other that are going to split apart and then they'll form two separate critters. But there also may be a few other paramecium strains in here. But you're going to see, compared to uh, an aquarium drop of water, this is pretty pure. And this is what you get when you do the boiling some barley or uh, putting a little bit of turnip or um, kale or 
even lettuce, uh, any of that stuff will work really well to get you started on this. Normal, dirty old aquarium water. Uh, you've got, you see the paramecium, and then you see, you see that thing flying by? Well, there's stuff that's so big, there's another little center type thing of some sort. There's so much life form, so much life in here, rather, that it's hard to even keep track of. Let's try to find a clump of something, and maybe we can find some more life. But you get everything from amoebas to worms to leeches um, that can be, especially if you're using wild water or, a, you know, a, a sample of water that has not been treated chemically or or filtered well. But there we just saw a nice, uh, a nice cyclops too, which is pretty cool. So we've got all, there it goes again. We've got all these creatures going by. We've got little seed shrimp and amphipods. Um, we've got nematodes, all sorts of stuff in here, just cruising by. And this is what happens if you don't get a reliable sample is you'll end up with this other stuff. And some people are excited for this other stuff. Um, also over time, anything big like the Cyclops or Triclops or uh, big uh, cr micro crustaceans, I say big, but all of this stuff is, you know, on the head of a pin kind of scale. Um, the largest thing, which is the little, uh, the little uh, cyclops in here that are going by really fast that we can't focus on. Um, those are actually about the size of what a very, like the smallest mark you could make with a pen, with a ballpoint pen is a pretty good way to describe their size. Um, and then these others are below the site, human sight level. but pretty interesting to see what can be living in your aquarium water especially in shrimp tanks uh, or snail tanks they contain a lot more life um, you can even have little um, you know larva and eggs of different things different types of algae plant material and this is in water that looks clear I mean when we were look or when I was piping this on here it looked like clear water. Those are those giants that were taking up the whole field of view that you see scooting around in the water. And that's the little things that are darting around on the side of your aquarium oftentimes. With, like I said, not necessarily anything wrong with them. Most of them are just bigger types of fish food. But it's nice for consistency's sake and for uh, the health of the fish to have a consistent paramecium uh, size strain and uh, food supply nutrition profile it helps you grow out fish at the same rate each time so all right guys I hope that was insightful for you and covered everything thoroughly so like I said this cloud of white dots that's those paramecium and usually the clumps you get next to it is actually cellulose or starch. Stuff that's from the barley being broken down by fungi and bacteria and archaea, uh, archaea bacteria. And then those are the colonies that get fed on by those little paramecium. So that's what will give you your consistency. And I like to date mine with a little Sharpie and then start a new one every two weeks. All it takes is one little pipette drop, dropper droplet full of the mixture to uh, start a new batch and uh, you'll be on your way to hatching lots and lots more fish. And you can see just in the time, just in the half hour or hour that we've been at the microscope and moving that we have far less fry uh, hanging out uh, in the open water or visible for us right now in the aquarium. They're uh, all kind of MIA or hiding in the bushes. 
and so they come out to feed it is really definitely a way you can get an idea of how many fry you ended up with also so i hope this was helpful and uh, i hope to give you guys an update on all these little critters and how they're all doing from the plecos to the cory cats that are in here to the garamis to the uh cpds or celestial pearl danios and to the erythromicron rasboras uh the emerald uh galaxy rasbora as it's sometimes known as well as i suppose the malawa shrimp which are also growing and hanging out in here. Now, here is a little teeny tiny baby Cory to kind of send you guys off with. That is a one day old Cory Dora sitting on that rock right there with the clear head and it still uh, needs to lay low. It's called a sticky head at this size. And uh, this is what a pleco looks like at that same stage essentially is when it's still got a little bit of yolk and as soon as that yolk or yellow is gone in the belly that's when you want to start feeding them the paramecium and that's also when they'll start to develop like this guy here and actually look like a Corydora so we'll end on this little Corydora here and uh, even though he looks a little funny and he's hanging out next to a shrimp and I'll talk to you next time, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, this is everything you needed to know about paramecium and uh, culturing infusoria at home with what you have. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye.